So, um, welcome to uh, the course GIFT 669, which is about the mechanical properties of steel. Uh, it's our first session, and I shall be talking um, about the subject of the course, the subject matter, uh, in an introductory uh, fashion. Uh, this course is offered in the spring semester, excuse me, the fall semester of 2013. Uh, the uh, textbook for the uh, course is currently not available. It will be published in 2014. It will be called the Introduction of Mechanical to the mechanical properties of steels. It's currently in preparation with Professor Kip Findlay at Colorado School of Mines. Uh, in the meanwhile, as the textbook is not available, we will, uh, uh, you know, you, I'll, I'll uh, make uh, slides available um, uh, through the uh, E-class system. Um, we meet uh, twice a week, 9.30 10.45 on Tuesdays and on Thursdays. And the, um, the course grading is based on uh, weekly uh, quizzes that are will be held on Thursday uh, morning before the start of every class. So there is no, no midterm or no final exam, just these um, uh, weekly uh, quizzes. The uh, subject matter that we will cover uh, in the course of the semester are basically subjects that um, probably uh, most of you know uh, the fundamentals of. Mm -hmm. The big difference between this course and the other courses you've taken in the past is that the entire uh, uh, course is focused on steel and only steel. So in contrast to uh, lectures you may have had as a, uh, an undergraduate where uh, mechanical metallurgy or uh, introductions to the mechanics of materials um, was illustrated with a wide variety of suitable uh, examples, we uh, do the reverse here. We take steel as uh, our starting point and we try to see and understand what happens in steels um, when we're focusing on the, the mechanical properties of steels. Mm -hmm. so, um, so today uh, we'll be talking introduction. Uh, and in the uh, later lectures, we'll start first of all to repeat or re um, um, go through uh, some of the fundamentals uh, you may not remember very well, so we'll, we'll talk about elasticity and plasticity, uh, the way uh, you've probably seen it in introduction to uh, mechanics of materials. Then we'll go, we'll also have to uh, repeat a few things related to crystallography and crystal defects. There we will spend some time talking about dislocations and their properties. Again, only as uh, in relation to steels, dislocations in steels, hmm? um, and crystal defects, yes, uh, such as particular vacancies. We'll talk about elements of crystal plasticity, and then we'll go into the, uh, uh, the subject matter uh, of the course, and we'll be talking about solid solution strengthening, strain hardening, grain size strengthening, precipitation strengthening, Stress strain curve calculation, yes, it is possible uh, to calculate stress strain curves of steels, even complex um, steels. It is possible to, uh, relatively easy actually, to calculate stress strain curve uh, of these steels um, using what you know about the, the strengthening mechanism due to the composition or the microstructure. We'll also talk about localization of deformation, so uh, strain localization, because it is very important in steels. Um, 
we'll talk about creep, fatigue, and, and we'll close with uh, fracture. Um, right, so let's start. Um, I don't have to tell you this. Most of you students at GIFT, so you know that steel is uh, very widely used in for instance, constructional applications. Uh, going anywhere from rebars to uh, roof tiles um, in uh, packaging application and for the uh, manufacture of furniture. Uh, consumer appliances, it's widely used. And examples uh, all around us in, uh, in air conditioning systems and uh, kitchen um, equipment such as microwave, uh, washing uh, machines, etc. Hmm? Uh, automotive is a big user of uh, steel-based uh, materials for the outer body, of course, but also for the powertrain and components of the powertrains. Um, and uh, we have the use of steel in uh, engineering applications, such as um, oil industry, shipbuilding, where um, the uh, a ship or a, for instance, offshore construction is almost entirely built of um, steel. So, and these are a couple of examples here uh, of these um, offshore uh, constructions. So, let us um, first start by a um, number of uh, simple concepts here. So when uh, a car is made, the uh, steel uh, that is used to make a car has gone f uh, through an incredible number of transformation processes. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, the uh, steel itself started as sometime in the past as, as a slab. Mm -hmm. So a uh, long uh, slab of material here that you see coming out of a continuous caster undergoes rolling treatments, undergoes various thermal treatments, may undergo surface treatment, and eventually leaves the steel plant as this coiled material. Hmm? And um, here is the process um, uh, that this steel goes through. Hmm? Um, the material has, steel has specific properties. Uh, specific composition, specific microstructure, that is the result of these, uh, uh, the processing. Now, of course, uh, a sheet of steel is not a car yet, so this material goes through press forming, low temperature uh, thermal treatments, welding, etc. Coating processes and, uh, for instance, a car, the, the car industry uh, manufactures a car body, which is then uh, further assembled into a passenger car. And that is the final product. So there's a huge amount of uh, processing uh, between the slab and the passenger car. Same holds for other products. Right? A, you have bar steel. Uh, goes through uh, various um, forging or forming processes, surface treatments, thermal treatments, to eventually become a crankshaft that will be part of a motor. Hmm? Wire steel will go through various amounts of treatments, mechanical, thermal, to, for instance, um, end up uh, as a useful um, high-strength Bolt, for instance. Hmm? Uh, so we create properties also through the transformation of these products, uh, the transformation of the steel into products. And once we have a product, a specific product, uh, where the, uh, the steel-based uh, element is part of, um, we have to consider in-service properties. Hmm? For instance, in the case of passenger cars, um, uh, it is important that the car body 
uh, provides passenger safety. So uh, in a high speed, uh, in, in a collision test, the, uh, the, the steel must have high speed strength mm, so that the car body has high speed crash resistance. In this case here, it's heavy spring, steel spring used for uh, rail cars. The spring must have long term uh, resistance against torsion. Yes, so I must have uh, guaranteed torsion fatigue life resistance um, resistance against uh, fracture in these conditions. In the case of heat exchangers, uh, the um, uh, we must have guarantees uh, for high temperature creep resistance. And so those are performance requirements, okay? So um, and throughout uh, uh, the making and shaping of steels, throughout the manufacturing of a, uh, a product, and throughout the use of this product, the mechanical properties of the steel play a key role. Hmm? Right, so how are these properties achieved? Well, they're achieved by the composition of the uh, material, of the steel, by the mechanical and the thermal uh, processing that this material goes through, hmm? and uh, the microstructure that is generated as a consequence of these two elements, composition and uh, mechanical and thermal processing. Hmm? This gives us mechanical properties uh, as such, and also specific uh, in-surface mechanical properties. Hmm? For instance, in the case of um, automotive uh, structural parts made out of steel, uh, high strain rate uh, deformation properties. So let's start with composition. Um, first of all, uh, people who don't have much experience with dealing with steels or with uh, ferrous alloys, uh, sometimes uh, they can have the idea that steels are, uh, contain a very large number of elements. In fact, so many that um, it doesn't seem reasonable. There doesn't seem to be a simple uh, explanation for the complexity of the uh, composition. Mm -hmm. And it um, looks as if uh, steels contain uh, almost all the elements of the periodic table, if I may be allowed to exaggerate a bit. That is not the case. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the periodic table of elements mm -hmm, and we select the elements uh, that are commonly found in steels, well, the, 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 uh, we get about 20 elements that are very common. Hmm? And uh, these elements are not there by chance, yes? They're there as a consequence of the manufacturing of the steel and their consequences, they're also a, a, a manufacturing of the, um, the production of this uh, iron and the steel and uh, as a consequence of the uh, alloying of the steel. Hmm? So let's have a look at uh, the elements in that sense. So first of all, you have elements such as uh, manganese, silicon, aluminum, carbon, that are always present in most steels uh, to a, a, a small degree or to a very lar or much larger degree, and that is because they're part of the, uh, the ore from which we extract the Iron, hmm? During, and uh, manganese is uh, such an element, silicon, aluminum, uh, uh, get reduced when we use carbon to reduce iron ore, for instance, in a blast furnace. And because we use carbon to reduce iron oxides in the ore um, uh, to metallic iron, yes, uh, using the, the formation of CO, uh, we always have uh, some carbon in our steels. Calcium uh, is a key element that is added during the uh, metallurgy 
of steel, metal steel metallurgy uh, to control the non-metallic inclusions, yes, and we'll come back to that in a moment. And so we always find that element to small degree in, back in our steels. Because we always use scrap uh, to make steel, uh, whether it's uh, to make electric arc, uh, steel produce, uh, uh, produce steel by using an like arc furnace, um, or uh, we make steel via the so-called uh, blast furnace BOF route, we always use scrap. In the case of an electric arc furnace, 100% of the charge is, almost 100% of the charge is uh, uh, scrap as far as metal goes. And in the case of the BOF furnace, we use scrap, uh, for instance, to uh, control the temperature hmm, in the BOF. Hmm. So uh, when we do this, there are always contaminants yes, that come from scrap recycling elements such as uh, tin, copper, phosphor, sulfur, hydrogen, uh, etc. And we call these element tramp elements and we try to keep their content as low as possible. Then we have elements such as uh, chrome, moly, nickel, boron. Uh, and that, uh, those are elements that we use to control the transformation in steels. In transformation, uh, I'm referring to the gamma alpha transformation, which is used to harden steel by, for instance, uh, letting the steel go through a Bainitic or a Martensitic transformation in order to allow this to happen uh, without having to use too high cooling rates, uh, we add these elements to steels very often. Hmm? And uh, so you'll find these elements uh, in steels that, uh, where they are required, uh, where transformations are actively being controlled. And then we have special alloying additions, which are very much depending on the applications. So for instance, if we want to have uh, very low alloy levels, very low carbon levels, but have a strong material. We will uh, very often micro alloy these steels with titanium, vanadium, niobium, so that these elements form carbides or nitrides or carbonitrides in the microstructure and give us precipitation strengthening and grain refinement. In the case of tool steel, we need extremely hard carbides to be formed in the microstructure and we'll have tungsten, moly, chrome carbides in the microstructure, we will have to add these elements to uh, high levels. Hmm? Uh, precipitation hardening can, for instance, be achieved by uh, adding copper to the uh, steel. Hmm? And um, there are, um, for instance, uh, certain steels, we will add elements such as sulfur or uh, uh, lead. Lead is being phased out, but sulfur. Uh, can also be used as machining addition to ease the uh, machining of parts. Um, uh, you will add these elements um, that in other steel grades you will want to avoid. And then uh, another element that is in that category is phosphorus that is, uh, can be used to strengthen, to, do, to give a solid solution strengthening of steels. Although in very many applications, such as, for instance, line pipes, phosphorus and, and, and sulfur are uh, very much um, uh, avoided in, as part of the uh, composition of the steel. And finally, we also have, as you know, we don't only have carbon steels, but we also have higher, more highly alloyed steels, such as stainless steels. And there we have typically alloying additions of chrome, moly, nickel, and nitrogen, uh, in which chrome, moly, and ni nitrogen additions are specifically to guarantee the corrosion resistance of the steel, and nickel is added to control the, uh, the type of crystal structure I will have, austenitic or ferritic. In case of nickel, so if you want austenitic microstructure, you need uh, to have a sizable amount of the concentration of nickel. Okay? So 
that's for the composition. Hmm? We have many elements that we can use as a toolbox to get um, some special um, uh, effects in our steel. Then um, we can, uh, through alloying, through processing, through thermal cycles, we can get different steel microstructures. Hmm? And uh, so we have some examples here. On the left, single phase ferrites, very simple. Hmm? What you see is just small grains of ferrite. And next to it, you see perlite, very different microstructure, uh, where we get a lot of um, cementite, iron carbide, alternating uh, uh, with ferrite in this layered pattern. You can get bainite hmm? and lath martensite if the steel is uh, made to transform at lower temperatures. Hmm? Um, and you can have steels, uh, and very many steels are in that category that are multi-phase steels, hmm? such as, for instance, in the example that I show, the dual-phase steels. So in addition to these um, simple uh, mic uh, macroscopic, uh, 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 microstructures, yes, uh, we also have in the microstructures uh, things that, um, that are the result of uh, the iron making and steel making. One of the more problematic aspects to the steel microstructures are the non-metallic inclusions. Most of the cases, we'd like to keep them, this, the concentration of these non-metallic inclusions uh, as low as possible. Hmm? Uh, but there is uh, uh, always a chance that some of them will remain. Uh, there can be spinel inclusions. There can be calcium sulfide inclusions. There can be manganese sulfide inclusions. There can be calcium aluminate inclusions. Uh, depending on what inclusions you have, uh, that you will have inclusions with different uh, properties. Some of them will be able to deform plastically. Others will not be able to deform plastically. Uh, and in general, their impact on the mechanical properties are negative. So, uh, 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 it is something we will be coming back uh, to talk about towards the end of the, the course when we talk about fracture because this type of inclusions, uh, second phase particles, non-metallic inclusions, non-metallic precipitate uh, play a key role in, uh, the, in, in fracture. The... Uh, we, uh, uh, we not only have non-metallic inclusions of the type oxides and sulfides, which are created during the iron and the steel making process, we also have uh, precipitates. And precipitates are, in general, uh, uh, much smaller uh, particles in the microstructure that are introduced in the microstructure in a trolled manner. Hmm? And I, I show here two examples. And in, uh, of, uh, so on, on, the, on the screen, they look much larger than the inclusions I just showed you. Uh, the reverse is actually true. These particles are much smaller than uh, the uh, non-metallic inclusion. So on the left, we see titanium nitride inclusion. And on top of this, so magnesium sulfide has precipitated. And on the right, you see a titanium nitride inclusion on which a niobium carbide uh, uh, has uh, precipitated. And, so, and one of the things we try to do um, uh, with precipitates is control mechanical properties in a, in a positive way, in particular because these precipitate, because of their size, their density and their distribution allow us to control the grain size of our steels and they also allow for precipitation strengthening. These precipitates have 
a much more positive role, uh, uh, much more positive impact on mechanical properties than the non-metallic inclusions. And, and so we will be talking about those also when we talk about the uh, when we are uh, uh, working on the chapter about precipitation uh, hardening. Hmm? Uh, these precipitates can be uh, the uh, nitrides, nitrides and carbides of previous picture. Uh, they can also be uh, the result of aging treatments. Hmm? So for instance, in this case, we have very small uh, uh, ME3C carbides hmm? uh, in a stainless steel which are not formed during uh, the manufacturing of the steel, but as a result of low temperature uh, uh, tempering. Hmm? And also these particles have an uh, interesting effect on the mechanical property, but it's a complex effect. And the reason is the following, is that um, uh, uh, the carbon in this particular steel can be in solution or can be present as a carbide. Hmm? Now, when the carbon is in solution, you, we get an effect called uh, solid solution strengthening. Yes? So when we precipitate the carbide out as a carb, uh, the carbon out as a carbide, we reduce the solid solution strengthening. However, at the same time, if these precipitates are small enough and distributed in the right manner, we get precipitation hardening. So um, in this case, the, the, the solid solution hardening reduction is partly compensated by an increase in the precipitation hardening. And so you can see we have a complex situation and part of the, uh, the course will be devoted to trying to understand and determine and calculate uh, how much loss of strength you get uh, and, uh, through uh, precipitation of carbides and how much increase of strength you get from the formation of these precipitates. It will turn out, just uh, uh, so you know in advance, that uh, the, the solid solution strengthening by carbon in ferrite is very, very strong. So uh, the result of this tempering treatment or, or, uh, and, the, and the resulting carbide formation uh, results in a overall reduction in strength despite the formation of these carbides, okay? So um, whenever um, uh, we talk about mechanical properties and uh, uh, strengthening effects, it's, al it's also important to uh, realize um, the uh, scale at which the, uh, the discussion of, of, of a certain mechanism um, or a certain theory uh, uh, is about. So, we talk about the macro scale when we consider, for instance, the slab we presented or coils or a, a bar of material. That's the macro scale. So that's meter scale or larger. Hmm? When we have test samples, yes, our um, dimensions are very different. Yeah? Our dimensions are of the order of centimeters, 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, so foot. So, um, when we go into the microstructure, hmm, for instance, in an optical microstructure, we observe the grain size of a steel. Uh, we are in what's currently being called the mesoscale. We're at in the 10 micron levels to 1 micron levels, 100 to uh, 1 micron level. The inclusions we were talking about, they're of the order of microns and less, yes? The precipitates we were talking about were in the uh, nanometer levels and atoms that are in solutions, we are in the sub-nanometer level. Hmm? So we have tools 
to study the mechanical properties at all these levels, yes? But uh, we, have to be, we always have to be aware about the scale at which the discussion occurs. Okay. The properties that steel offers us are offer us are very wide. We can have steels uh, with strengths levels from 100 to 200. Yes, commercial steels uh, and uh, steels that have strength levels up to 3,000 megapascal and more. Hmm? These steels are all commercially available, yes? Um, and um, they're used in a wide variety of applications, yes? They're not, although they will, m most of these steels contain 90 to 95% of iron, yes? They will be very different in microstructure and composition. Uh, and so in order to, wh when we have very soft steels, we have very specific microstructure and composition. When we have very uh, hard and strong steels, we have also very specific microstructures and compositions. But achieving extremely high strengths in, uh, in steels is actually not that much, not that difficult. Hmm? Uh, you can um, reach, at this stage, uh, wire strengths that are of the level of about four megapascal, excuse me, four gigapascal. Uh, uh, and uh, the big uh, uh, challenge with steels is to make the mechanical properties appropriate for the application. Hmm? Not so much whether or not it is possible to achieve extremes of formability of, or, or plasticity or extremes of strength. It's, you have to have the right combination um, uh, for an application. Okay. Right, so let's have a look at these scales, these length scales, to see what is, um, what is important. So say we, you know, you've just tested a round steel bar, broken it, and so what's happened inside the material? When you look with your optical microscope, you see a microstructure, which is very often a uh, complex, multi-phase microstructure. You don't really see uh, much more than uh, general parameters of this microstructure. For instance, the grain size, the volume fraction of this yellow phase here, which happens to be Martin size. Yes. Um, and um, so if you want to um, actually see what causes the, uh, the plastic deformation, you have to uh, take this sample and put it in a TM, and then what you see are dislocations. Hmm? And um, what you actually see in your microscope are not the dislocations themselves, but the interaction between your electron beam and the uh, strains, the lattice strains introduced around the dislocation, dislocation cores. Yeah? And if you look, if you're able to look at the atomic level at this, these dislocations, what you will find is that they consist of a, um, and that they are a, uh, a very specific lattice defect, uh, which is key to plastic deformation in many crystalline materials. Mm -hmm. And in steels, uh, dislocations are the, uh, and dislocation uh, formation, dislocation mobility, and dislocation uh, multiplication, will be key processes that, uh, to describe the uh, plasticity of steel and the strength also of steel. Right. So, so let me be very clear. It doesn't matter whether you are producing 
uh, for instance, a heavy forging at high temperatures, as in this open die uh, press uh, forging uh, machine here, uh, inside the microstructure, your steel, yes, can deform because you have dislocations in the microstructures. In the microstructure, you create dislocations, you can multiply dislocations, and these dislocations can move around and make plastic deformation possible. So in this industrial process at high temperature, but also when you are uh, doing a, a simple tensile test, uh, it is the dislocations in the microstructure that will give you the, uh, this, th that will be responsible for strength, and the properties of dislocation will, will explain why you have strength, why you have strengthening, and, uh, and, and why you have plasticity. Okay. And why is that? Well, when you take a, uh, a so-called um, uh, tensile test specimen, steel, you pull it, you strain it, and you measure the strain, and you measure the stress that's necessary to, uh, to obtain this strain, uh, you find what's called a stress-strain curve. Which is, and you, most of you are familiar with this uh, stress strain curve. This is the stress strain curve for steel. It's got this typical yield point that's not very good looking. Yes, uh, but what is of interest here to me is, is this increase in the uh, in the stress that's necessary to achieve deformation. Mm -hmm. And um, well, what is happening here is that. The plastic deformation, i.e. the strain that I achieve, is due to the formation, uh, creation, and motion of the dislocations in the little crystals that make out my steel. Mm -hmm. And it is the motion of these dislocations that allow plastic deformation to occur. Mm -hmm. And strength is actually nothing else than resistance to the motion of these dislocations. And in a nutshell, that's what the course, this course, GIF uh, T669, is all about, is uh, what happens to dislocations when they are trying to move in the lattice under the influence of stresses, applied stresses, and they encounter obstacles to their motion in the lattice. Okay. So, um, let's think a little bit uh, back on uh, what we know from introduction in mechanical metallurgy and, uh, and look at our uh, stress-strain curve. Mm -hmm. So we have this strange yield point, mm -hmm. then we have a hardening stage in our stress curve. At a particular point, which we call the ultimate tensile strength, we see that the samples develop a diffuse neck, hmm? diffuse neck, and then in certain cases, we get we get a local neck, a well, very well defined uh, deformation band, before the fracture occurs. Yeah? So these parameters that we can measure: the yield strength, the tensile strength. The Uniform elongation, that's the elongation at the ultimate tensile strength, and the fracture stress or the total elongation um, are very much used in engineering practice. They are, however, not material constants. Uh, these uh, properties uh, would be very different if we uh, had done the test in other conditions, yes? So, and I'll say a few words about that. So these material properties that you see in catalogs of steel makers or other material producers, strengths, etc., they are not material constants. They are depending on the following. They are 
depending on, for instance, the temperature. You change the temperature at which you do the test, you change the properties that, the, uh, that you measure. This is an example here for a ferritic stainless steel. It's a, nothing very special in terms of microstructure. But even that steel um, has a uh, stress drinker, which changes a lot when you change the temperature. So we're all familiar from our introductions in materials uh, properties as undergraduates that uh, you know, when you reduce the temperature, the, uh, the strength goes up. And when you increase the temperature, the strength goes down. So let's have a look at whether this rule is obeyed in this case. Well, uh, the black line gives me stress strain curve at room temperature, yes. And when I decrease the temperature to minus 30 degrees C, the stress strain curve moves upward. I get a material that's stronger, yes. So that's okay. That's what we expected. And if I increase the temperature to 200 degrees C, the material becomes softer. So that's nice too. However, you can see that something very funny happens to the stress strain curve. Yeah? The stress strain curve looks very sickly. Yes? Gone is the smoothness uh, of the line and we see all these what are called serrations. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, well, something has happened to the material. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't know what it is, yes, but cert, you know, something has happened to the material, which, uh, which I cannot explain just uh, on the basis of materials becoming uh, stronger when you reduce the temperature and, and softer when you increase the temperature. Hmm? Let's continue and look at these strange, uh, strange behavior. Uh, if I uh, look at um, uh, now not a ferritic steel but an austenitic steel which has an FCC structure and let's look at uh, an austenitic iron manganese aluminum carbon whip steels and let's do the same thing uh, change the temperature hmm? well the first thing we notice is that this steel uh, reaches a UTS at room temperatures that's the black line of over a thousand megapascal. Now let's go back to the ferrite I just had, the UTS 500. So in this case, this steel has a strength, a UTS that's double of that of the ferritic steel. Hmm? Why is that? Well, uh, there are many reasons, but the, 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 the prime reason is because I'm looking at the different crystal structure. Ferritic steel has a particular crystal structure, it's BCC. The austenitic steel has a particular crystal structure, it's austenitic. And the dislocations in these two structures are vastly different, yes? As a consequence, I get very different properties, even at room temperature. What happens when I uh, go from minus 70 to plus 300 degrees C? I see indeed what I expect that the, uh, the strength of the material generally decreases. This, so that's what I expected from my undergraduate knowledge. However, again, uh, in, certain, in a certain temperature range here, you can see um, at around 200, 100, 200 degrees C, the, uh, the stress strain curve suddenly develops these, uh, very com this very complex pattern of serrations, yes? Uh, which are not obvious uh, uh, where they're coming from. And we'll be talking about them because they're due to what we call localization of strain. Hmm? Okay. Right, so uh, in case you didn't believe me that uh, austenite and ferrite have vastly different uh, mechanical properties, Let's look at a very uh, nice example where the two materials are tested, the austenite and the ferrite are tested at 1200 degrees C. Yes. And this is a special experiment we did where uh, we had austenite, austenitic alloy, and a ferritic alloy with 
almost the same composition, yes, uh, so that you could have these two phases um, at 1200 degrees C and, and both would be stable at that temperature. So you can do a test where you just have the crystal structures that are different. And you can see here that uh, there are the shape of the curves. Don't worry too much about the shape of the curve because the shape of the curves is, is partly due to the fact that we, the, the tests are done at very high temperature, 1200 degrees C. But you can see that the ferrite is much, much uh, softer than the austenite. In, uh, in these uh, stress strain curves that are obtained, that were obtained by uh, torsion um, tests. Mm? Okay? So let's come back to this obvious thing we were talking about that materials get uh, softer when uh, we heat them. And, uh, and, 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 and let's just try to check, um, is that always the case? Yeah? Uh, do we really understand what's happening? Um, and uh, I'm going to show you an example of a, a steel that's um, very common steel. It's a very common alloy. It's, uh, it's basically a, a nitrogen alloy. Uh, and, and it's very low nitrogen levels. You know, we're talking about a few hundred, hundred ppm of nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, ultra low carbon steel, so it, it doesn't have much strength uh, to speak of. Yeah. And so now let's redo this experiment where we, uh, we um, uh, go from minus 80 to plus 200, yes? And, uh, and let's measure the strength. Well, okay, well, let's look at room temperature. The room temperature curve is this black line. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now let's look at 200 degrees C. And of course, the material should be softer. But it isn't. You can see this huge increase in strength at 200 degrees C. And you can see it here also. Um, and in addition, you get these, these very, very heavily serrated curves. So, uh, Materials do not have to become softer as uh, you increase the temperature. There may be processes that will cause the material to get stronger uh, as you increase the temperature. Mm -hmm. and, and this is one of the things we'll try to understand but in the course of this, these lectures, but also illustrates the fact that steels, um, uh, being a, representing a very, very wide range of uh, ferrous alloys also uh, uh, can display a very, very wide range and very rich spectrum of mechanical properties, hmm? which we, in the course of this, uh, these lectures, we will ex be exploring. Hmm? Same thing with, uh, say, uh, the, uh, the following uh, properties. Uh, if I ask you, uh, put to you the question, what happens when you get in a, involved in a collision, in a car collision? Um, the uh, uh, properties that uh, are usually made available uh, to you about a material uh, by a manufacturer are room temperature properties measured at relatively low strain rates. Hmm? Typically 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 2 per second. Hmm? Those are strain rates that we use to do tensile tests, typically. And tensile tests are very widely used in the industry, the materials industry, and not only in the steel industry, polymers and other non-ferrous metals included. So what happens when you get into a collision? Yes? Will your material be, become stronger or weaker? Hmm? Uh, it turns out that uh, for the steels that uh, are uh, designed uh, for this particular uh, uh, situation, yes? so the crash absorbing uh, structural steels in your car, the 
uh, stress strain uh, curves at high strain rates, yes, tell us that the material strengthens even more at the high strain rates, and there is no reduction in plasticity. And so the black line here shows a static test, basically meaning 10 to the minus 3 per second, and then the red, the green, and the blue lines show the stress strain curve at high uh, strain rates. And you see, if anything, the stress strain curves look even better. So um, if uh, your car has uh, crush members, uh, structural uh, crush members, uh, as part of the car body, uh, which are these carbon manganese silicon trip steels, you can be confident that uh, in this particular uh, unfortunate event of a collision that uh, this, the properties of the steels will, will actually be uh, better than the ones uh, you have in static situation. So very important um, uh, in-service property. Hmm? Uh, the reason why this happened is not obvious. Hmm? You need to know uh, what is the microstructure of this steel uh, uh, to, to understand why, why it behaves this way. But that will be part of uh, the course to explore this together. So, to wrap up my uh, introductory lecture, uh, so the lecture will be uh, focusing on understanding the theory and the fundamentals of the various uh, strengthening mechanism in steel, and then make sure that we translate this theory mm, into engineering information, right? Let's, we will in introduce theories that we can actually use in practice to do relatively simple calculation, which will allow us to gain uh, insight and calculate quantitative things, mm, such as a stress strain curve. Hmm? So we'll give you the tools to calculate specific uh, mechanical properties of steels and we'll show you how to use them uh, by means of um, many uh, worked examples in the course of the lectures. So I thank you for your attention and I look forward